Welcome to the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center and the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, September 29th, 2022. My guest today is Dr. Biljana Lilly, the author of a new book from the Naval Institute Press called Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. Biljana, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Your bio is very interesting. You're currently working as a geopolitical risk lead at the Krebs Stamos Group. You've worked in the past as a cyber expert and cyber manager at Deloitte and at the RAND Corporation. You've spoken at DEF CON and SciCon and been cited in the Wall Street Journal and Foreign Policy Magazine. You're here today at the Naval Institute for a panel discussion later this morning featuring you and Dr. Martin Lubicki and moderated by Dr. Fiona Hill. I can't wait to see that. And the topic of that panel is cyber disruption and disinformation. So let's start with current events and work backward a bit. How would you judge Russia's information warfare campaign in the lead up to and since the invasion of Ukraine? What's gone well for the Russians and what's mm -hmm. gone badly? That's a great question. So in Russia's mindset, information warfare, as you rightly uh, pointed out, is a new version of warfare that entails that the objective is to, to erode the decision-making processes of the adversary and to undermine their social and political systems. And that's, this is done through psychological warfare as well as through technological and digital disruption or disruption of their information um, space and information operations. And in Ukraine, the war is still ongoing and we're collecting evidence as we go because of that. But we already know that the Russian government has started to preposition malware and conduct reconnaissance to identify targets that they could attack in cyberspace already about a year in advance. There was a really good report published by Microsoft that identified at least six APTs, those are advanced persistent threat actors, basically cyber groups working on behalf of the Russian government that have been prepositioning mal malware in different um, in different critical infrastructure uh, in Ukraine and have been looking for vulnerabilities. So in, in 2021, yeah, prior to the Yeah, that's right, invasion. exactly. Okay. So already a year in advance. And um, we have seen, so the two elements of information warfare are cyber operations and psychological operations, which are, it's a oversimplification of the term and they are associated operations, but those are the two main ones. And we have seen a lot of disinformation narratives already decades, for decades ago, but the war, it's also important to point out, started already in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. We started to pay attention to different conflicts and we kind of lost our, our attention on that conflict and the emphasis on it. But what started again in February of this year is a continuation and an escalation of a war that already started in 2014. So we know that there have been already a lot of cyber operations again against Ukraine since 2014 and earlier, as well as disinformation campaigns. But I would say that if we have to talk about this particular episode of the war, it started at least a year in advance um, with prepositioning of, um, of uh, malware. It seems like the Ukrainians did a pretty good job fighting back or, or defending themselves. That's right. I would, I would assess at this point that that's the case, but they also received a lot of help from the private sector which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we see such a consolidated effort from multinational organizations, as well as from not only the private sector, but also NATO and individual member states. They've been uh, hugely helpful for Ukraine, and they continue to help. And the Ukrainian government has done fantastic as well. And um, uh, with regards to whether the Russians are doing well, um, I believe that was a part of your first question. Yes, right. And um, so I think... Because so much is going on, we're assessing individual cases, but we already have examples of some attacks that didn't materialize in the, in the way that we think the Russian forces envisioned. Like there was a malware deployed in Destroyer 2, which was a version of a previous um, wiper malware that was deployed a few years back. And what we believe the Russians objective, the, the objective of the Russian military was, was to basically shut down the, the electricity for about two, two million Ukrainians. And they tried and they failed to do that. So international support, Ukraine's actual cyber defense forces, I think, play a huge role in, try in defending their networks. Yeah, that was one of the things that surprised me. I mean, many people, right, was expecting that on, as, the, as the Russians departed, you know, went over the line of departure, their, their, their physical forces 
that you would see uh, Ukrainian networks just completely go black That's right. and Ukrainian uh, electrical grid just completely go black, and that didn't happen, That's which right. is really pretty amazing. That's right. Okay. Um, how does the Russian government think about information warfare and cyber operations? How much emphasis do they put on the information space? So I'm probably biased because this is the one of my favorite topics, so I would say yeah. a lot of em emphasis is put on it. <laughs> but I do think that that's actually an objective assessment. I, I look at their modern doctrine of warfare, and a lot of it focuses on information warfare. And there are a few military are scholarship from, from very high-level military officers that even provide a quantitative measure, which to this day when I ask experts, okay, what really goes into those numbers? No one can really tell me. Yeah. But one of the experts, um, a military scholar, well-respected, a Russian military scholar, writes that disinformation and basically information operations right now are 90% of the war effort, 9-0, which is huge. Wow. Um, in the Gerasimov, the so-called Gerasimov Doctrine, right. Afterwards, we keep on, we have been debating that term for a long time, but the article that General Gerasimov wrote, right. I, um, I'll try to avoid using that term, but I already use it, so, but please chief, don't chief use Gerasimov. Of staff the chief of military. staff, yeah. Yes. General Gerasimov, he even said that um, information warfare versus the other, the correlation of forces was four to one. But again, what goes in those four to one ratio? What are, what are the activities that go into that? It wasn't really clear. So I would say they're placing a huge emphasis on it at the moment. Good to know. Um, so proceedings, uh, readers, our listeners are familiar with Gerasimov Doctrine. It's been in some of our uh, articles, hybrid warfare, political warfare, some of these terms. Um, what, what is, uh, what's some of that doctrine that shapes their organization and then their, their operations? Aside from the Gerasimov Doctrine, mm -hmm. are, are there other you know, sort of strategic level military or, or even, you know, whole of government level doctrine Absolutely. that shapes that? Absolutely, yes. The document that I would say is the key document to read on the topic is a doctrine, the doctrine of information space that was published by the Russian government. It's an official doctrine in 2011. And okay. in that doctrine, the Russian government provided a definition of information war or information warfare. And the term we roughly translate it as information war or information warfare, but in Russian, there are several terms. Informacionne protivaborstva, informacionne vaina, informacionne barba. I think those are the main, the main ones that I've seen in the literature. But they basically, in that 2011 document, they provide a definition of the term. And it's very general, and it basically stipulates that information warfare is confrontation between states, and it's conducting, conducted during peace and war, and then they list the objectives of information warfare. They don't elaborate further on what it is in essence, but they list the objectives. So they have okay. a way of defining it through objectives. And the objectives are, basically they list four of them in there, and they are to disrupt the digital and technological infrastructure of the adversary. And then the other three all pertain to exerting psychological effects. Like uh, one of them was to um, uh, destabilize the population to affect the decision-making process and to inflict psychological damage on the political and societal systems. So it's, it basically shows you, that definition shows you that there is a technological component and a psychological component, and they're both intertwined. So that doctrine, 2011. 2011. So we're now 11 years past that. Mm -hmm. We're now into, you know, there's been the invasion of, of or, or takeover of Crimea, uh, and now the that's invasion right. of Ukraine, the war that's going on. Is that... Are they adapting that doctrine? Are they still following it? So, I was going to say, don't quote me on that, but probably <laughs> we're on air, so probably it's gonna. So, I also have another hypothesis. Um, they haven't really named that as a uh, information warfare doctrine, but about two or three weeks ago, the Russian government issued a document weirdly called Russia's um, Humanitarian Policy Abroad. And several uh -huh. experts, so that's basically how it was called. Humanitarian policy. I know, it was, it's, yeah, it made me chuckle and also I was horrified when I saw it. But yeah, they have that codified right now. It's a, it's a document. And some pundits said, oh, this is a new foreign policy doctrine. It's not a new foreign policy doctrine. They have a separate foreign policy doctrine. And let's not say it's a foreign policy doctrine because usually when the Russians come up with a foreign policy doctrine, it supersedes the previous one. Okay. But so this is a supplementary document that should be um, taken into consideration together with the foreign policy doctrine. But what was interesting to me to see in that document was that the Russian government basically said, we're being vilif vilif um, 
vilified and our reputation is being dis besmirched in foreign policy media. So okay. they say this discourse that's very negative of our country and our image, it is a threat to national security. Ah. So the way we're going to fight it is through our own channels of communication, through building contacts with parties that are pro-Russian, so imagine all right movements basically, right. through cultural centers, through our own state-sponsored media, and we're going to spread a positive image of Russia. So this to me sounds exactly like one of the two elements of information warfare that stipulates we will erode the psychological, psychological state of our adversary, their, their psychology, their mind, basically. We're going to target their mind. And how do we do that? For a narrative that's positive of Russia. So I think that document can provide a little more, can enrich our understanding of what information warfare is. And the scary thing about it is once the Russians codify a problem like this, government resources will go to basically support that effort. So now we'll probably see more resources going into state-sponsored media, into Russian centers abroad that promote, promote cultural understanding of the Russian type and Got all it. of those different activities. Got it. Okay. Uh, so news of Russian cyber operations and, and your book often you know, include references to uh, the FSB, uh, the SVR, the GRU, uh, the hacking groups, Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear, Sandworm, come up in your book, and they come up in, in uh, press reporting uh, you know, quite often. So can you describe the main Russian government actors in cyberspace, and what are their areas of expertise or lethality, and, and, and how do they adapt? Mm, that's a great question. So we keep on collecting information on this, and because it's not clear to us, because a lot of this is classified, sometimes we even refer one cyber group first to one unit and then we decide, or one agency, and then we decide it's another agency that's managing it. So okay. at this point, I would say there are three main agencies that likely have cyber threat actors that are targeting foreign targets. And those are the GRU, which is military intelligence, SVR, and FSB. Those are the three ones. And they each have several cyber groups that focus I would say the delineation between what they would focus on before was more than at the moment. They all target political targets. They all target um, private sector targets as well. And the most interesting to me is the GRU, Fancy Bear, Sandworm, and different cyber threat actors that are associated with the GRU, which is military intelligence, because they are the ones that, that seem to, to unite well cyber operations and psychological operations. Okay. So they're the ones that are trained to actually integrate this concept of information warfare in their operations, and those will be the ones I'll be most worried about. Okay. Um, your book includes a number of case studies. I think it's seven or eight case studies. That's right. Uh, and they range from 2007 to 2017. So the first one you, you delve into is the distributed denial of service attacks against the Estonian government. And then the last one is the, uh, the meddling in the French presidential elections in 2017. At a strategic level, what was Russia trying to accomplish with those two examples, and were they successful? So they had different objectives in every case. And I tried to make sure that I don't create a one fit all strategy yeah. in this case. So in Estonia, it was really interesting. I don't, I don't think anyone expected such an escalation. The Estonian government wanted to reposition a statue of a bronze soldier that symbolized Russia's liberation of Estonia during the Second World War from the center of Estonia to a more preferable location. And the soldier was, it was a, not a, such a magnificent statue. I actually went and saw him a few times to pay my tributes because uh -huh. what happened was the Estonians were repositioning the soldiers and this created a huge reaction from the, from the Russian government and four waves of DDoS attacks because of the soldier, the re relocation of the soldier. Basically to Russia, those monuments are so important because they symbolize a past era or a past period that the Russians are really proud of. So they almost accepted it as an affront and as a, as a threat to their, to their reputation. Right. And, um, Victory Day, 9 May every year. Is, yes. That's the largest national yes. holiday in, Absolutely. in Russia still. Absolutely. So the end of World War II, signifying their victory over the Nazi exactly. Germanys, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, they keep yeah. on reliving that past, they and do. it's exactly that, so. That's just, the glory. Yeah. Exactly. And you have the, 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 the Iskanders rolling through military parades in the middle of Moscow for Red Square, mm -hmm. and it's a huge, exactly. It's a very important to them. And I, I, didn't, I don't think that the Estonians expected that, but the result was four waves of DDoS attacks. The result was a DDoS, lot of protest. De de denial, denial of service. Exactly. Essentially shutting down or overwhelming 
the digital infrastructure of Estonia or the Estonian government. Perfect, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I, I sometimes forget that those terms are not, <laughs> you know, very typical and very well known by everyone. Thank you, exactly. So in addition to that, the Russians also used these uh, supported protests around the statue. They um, applied economic pressure on Estonia. They even sent the Russian delegation to try to dissuade the Estonian government from moving the statue. They spread disinformation. There were a number of activities. And if we think that the objective of the Russian government at that time was to keep the statue where it was, they totally failed. Right. The Estonians still moved the statue, and I would say even as a result of that, we had, um, we had a lot of international support for Estonia, and one of the best things that came out of it, I think, is the CCDCOE, which is NATO's center of, Cyber Center of Excellence, which is right now located in, in, in Tallinn, right? In Tallinn, yes, yeah. and there's every year the SICON conference happens there, which is a wonderful event. Anyone interested in cyber, I would say, go and at, at least attend once, speak there. I uh, made a lot of friends there, a lot of contacts with cyber commands of different NATO members because every year we have that conference there, we present papers and we exchange ideas. And it's all because of the DDoS attacks that Russia decided to initiate so, against Estonia. So NATO responded to that by creating a center of, a center of excellence. That's right for cyber security in, in Tallinn. That's right, right. exactly. Interesting. So that's the negative consequence. So yeah. I think Putin totally failed there. He failed, okay. Absolutely. Uh, with France, the other case you mentioned. So in the case of France, the um, Russian government tried to replicate their success in the United States. Success or failure, we can debate it. There are different elements to that. But basically in 2016, there was a hack and leak operation. Um, files from the DNC or the Democratic National Committee were exfiltrated and then strategically released to the population and then the media picked it up and they became a part of the campaign against Hillary Clinton and a lot of it was very much pro-Trump coverage during that time. And the Russians tried to do the same in France because there was a pro-Russian candidate, Marine Le Pen, and a pretty anti-Russian candidate, which was President Macron after he became president. So they hacked the campaign of President Macron, exfiltrated a lot of information that they thought the media is going to pick up, but it wasn't. It didn't spread with in the way it spread in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that they definitely failed in that case. Okay. Um, for U.S., you know, to bring it to our audience, which is largely a sea services, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard uh, audience, what are two or three salient points you would make about Russian cyber operations. So if you had a chance to advise the Chief of Naval Operations or the Commandant of the Marine Corps, for example, uh, what, what, are, what are some of the, you know, the top two or three points you'd make to them? Definitely protect your critical assets, your most valuable weapons. Make sure that um, you have up-to-date cyber defenses and uh, you update and patch your systems and all of that. Command and control is secured and infrastructure is hardened. Like I would go down the list of basic and advanced cyber hygiene um, items that have to be basically, you have to ensure that they are, they are up to date. Um, I would say practice your incident response playbooks mm. because in case you have a system breach, you have to practice how you would act under different scenarios. I would say definitely make sure you practice um, a situation where some of your command and control structures have been impacted by a disruptive attack, like a GDOS attack or wiper malware, which is a type of... We've seen a lot of those types of attacks in Ukraine at the moment. I would also, make, I would also advise, make sure that you... When you think about cyber operations, think about the broader context of cyber operations and disinformation, because ultimately, still in this day and age, we're not in the robot age yet, Weapons are operated by humans. Mm. And the minds of your, your men are one of the most vulnerable. They're the, the most powerful, but also the most vulnerable um, target that the Russian government can target. And now, because of the GRU, for example, the uh, military Russian military, exactly, yeah. they have a lot of vicious ways to unite cyber operations and disinformation. So make sure that you, you train your professionals to know that there must be, that sometimes phones can be hacked and they can get information, let's say it's in the heat of battle and you have to make a decision on whether to fire a weapon or not and you get a message that let's say your spouse is in the hospital. Mm. Make sure that you prepare your servicemen to know that they may face such disinformation operations in the most critical moments. So that would be my advice. Well, that brings up a, a, a question and it seems that you know, on the battlefield in Ukraine that the Ukrainian soldiers are very tied in. You know, they still have their phones. They're, con they're connecting with... That's and right. They're, uh, you know, they're on social media, they're, they're reporting back, they're sharing video 
of you know some of the destruction, right? Uh, I think right. in the U.S. government, you know, largely, when when a ship gets underway, for example, our sailors are kind of disconnected from, you know, from their phones. Um, but, you know, in your opinion, is it is it super important that we even leave those phones at home? That we, particularly as we're going into operations mm -hmm. where the escalation is possible, that uh, we disconnect our soldiers, sailors, marines, uh, you know, from from the internet, from the ability to be influenced from outside. So I know that this is a very complex issue and I don't want to say yes or no. Yeah. But in the case of Ukraine, I think it's hugely helpful that they're connected because they also, they show the world what's happening. Yeah. They make sure that we don't forget that they're fighting on the front lines and they're literally crimes against humanity being committed right now in Ukraine. So I think they should definitely have their phones and continue to, to spread the message as much as possible. In the U.S. case... We, I would imagine, will have a support in whatever battle we go. We don't really need to ratchet the international community as much. But I would say maybe in some cases there would be similar value. Yeah. So I would say probably keep your phones. Uh, so we're running short on time. I just want to give the floor to you. Any last points to make about your book? Uh, any predictions about what Russians might do next in the information operations sphere? I hope people find it valuable. <laughs> That's probably what I would say. Um, I, had a, I had a lot of fun writing it. I uh, used seven or eight languages in that book as well, so it's a product of a lot of work, and I'm very grateful. I want to thank a lot of the people that I spoke with in Finland, Norway, Estonia, our colleagues in Germany who helped me find a lot of the information and directed me to the valuable sources here. And also my friends in Bulgaria and colleagues who also helped me, especially on the Bulgarian case, because in the case of Bulgaria, the chapter reads almost to me like an action movie because they were the Russians tried to um, poison an arms dealer twice and they weren't successful. They were, they, they the Russians most likely, are big on poison. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't drink. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, a lot of things, yeah. But uh, that was really interesting. And um, they also most likely staged explosions in weapons factories, most likely killed um, one soldier as well. And I managed to piece the story together only because I had Bulgarian colleagues who directed me to some of those sources, which are still only translated in, Bul only in Bulgarian. They're not translated in English. So mm. I want to specifically give them a shout out and thank them for that. Um, and um, what was your second question, Bill? Um, like, oh, uh, any predictions for what we might see in the next month, two, three, you know? I, I mean, there's a lot in the news right now that, yes. that paints Putin as being in a corner, as being kind yep. of in a desperate situation, right? This, yep. this war is not going well for him. He's calling up 300,000 uh, reservists to send them to the front. Mm -hmm. People are leaving the country, uh, military age men and women are, are leaving the country mm -hmm. because they don't want to be dragged into this war. Uh, so it's not going well. So what, what kinds of things will happen in the information sphere now that Putin's in this really tight situation? I would expect this is the prediction. Yeah. Um, my hypothesis would be, and my assessment will be that we should brace ourselves for impact. Mm. And I would expect a lot more disruptive operations in cyberspace against Western countries and Western um, infrastructure, including the United States. So the target won't just be in Ukraine. It'll be oh, no. NATO nations Not at all. in the United States, infrastructure. Absolutely. Scary. Okay. Well, our guest today has been Biliana Lilly. She's the author of this amazing book, Russian Cyber Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. It's available from the Naval Institute Press at usni.org slash books. Liliana, thank you so much for your book and for being a guest today. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. If you enjoyed the show, like us, subscribe to our channel, tell your friends, become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.